was thirsty. Bread of life, what if I said I was hungry?
thank you so much, God. We love you. We honor you, Father. God, we declare that you are everything that we need. God, we thank you for breath in our lungs. God, we thank you, Father, for who you are in our lives. God, we, we thank you. We're just filled, Father, with hope and expectation. Father, that you are not only with us, God, but you're coming for us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, welcome, welcome to Catalyst at Home. We're so honored that you decided to join us. We trust that you had a wonderful, wonderful Christmas uh, with your family. And uh, we, do, we do hope that it was uh, a, a great time to just uh, be together. And so um, we are excited to be bringing the last installment of our Advent series to you at home in your living rooms. Um, and then we will be back together uh, for the first Sunday in January back in person. So we hope you'll make plans to join us. So we'll jump into the message in just a moment. Catalyst Church, uh, wherever you are tuning in uh, this morning. <clears throat> we are usually here uh, at the Bethesda Hotel, uh, 8120 Wisconsin Avenue, uh, having church, uh, 930 and 1115, and uh, I miss seeing you right now. And, uh, but we have this Sunday, uh, the 26th, uh, as a Sunday where we only do Catalyst at home. And uh, the reason for that. Uh, first and foremost, we have an incredible team uh, called our Dream Team uh, who serve each and every Sunday uh, and truly make Catalyst Church what it is, an incredible family to be a part of. And we wanted to give them a Sunday where they can sleep in and rest. So why don't you show our Dream Team some love in the chat area, Come on, especially our setup team and production team and our kids team, so many teams uh, that make our Sundays incredible. And uh, we're so grateful for them. So if you are on on our dream team. Thank you. I hope you are enjoying this Sunday uh, in your PJs. And I can't wait to be back with you next Sunday, uh, January 2nd. Uh, we are back at the Bethesda Hotel, uh, 9 30, 11 15, kicking off a brand new series called Play the Long Game. And uh, we're going to be talking about some, some practices that we can put in our life uh, that'll bear fruit. Uh, well beyond the moment. I know that the, the, the new year time, it's honestly uh, my favorite time of year. A uh, time of expectation, a time of a lot of hope, a uh, time of excited for a brand new year. And I know what's a time of New Year's resolutions, and, and my hope is to, we're going to talk through biblically uh, some practices we can put in our life that are not merely resolutions that we do not fulfill, as most resolutions end up unfulfilled, but truly practices that can change our life uh, with the help of God. Uh, so be here in church next Sunday for that. Also next Sunday, we are having next steps. Uh, I believe one of the best decisions that you can make uh, beginning the year is to get planted in a local church. And if you don't have one, we'd love to invite you to be a part of Catalyst Church. And next steps, you'll hear more about uh, what that entails, uh, who we are as a church, more importantly, how you can get connected and grow spiritually. Uh, it'll happen after our 1115 service next Sunday, about 1245. Uh, it's only an hour uh, in length, and uh, would love to see you there. Uh, the next Sunday, and I'm kind of sharing some info, but the next Sunday, January 9th, uh, we'll, and we'll talk more next Sunday about that. Uh, we are kicking off 21 days of prayer and fasting. 
Um, I love this time of year. I know it can seem odd on the day after Christmas where you feasted to think about fasting. Uh, And it is not a diet. Uh, It is a spiritual practice to withdraw from the world a little bit uh, and to lean into God. And can I tell you, through my years of these 21 days of prayer and fasting in January, uh, God has done incredible things in my life. Uh, I'll even probably share over the course of these 21 days how um, even how Catalyst Church came in to, to, to be was in part of, of God moving during these 21 days of prayer and fasting for Christine and I years ago. And I'm really expecting for what God's going to do. A couple things to make note of. We have a 21 days of prayer uh, website. You'll see below on the link. You can go to that on our website. Uh, also, we'll have it linked on our homepage uh, with some resources. There's a prayer playlist to use your devotional time. Uh, we have a prayer guide to help give you some structure to your prayer time. I have previous messages I've done on prayer to help you in this time. Uh, there's also on there a prayer guide for kids, for your kids to take part in this, uh, which, is, which is pretty uh, exciting. Uh, but I encourage you to go on there, check out the resources, really lean in. Uh, And pray and ask God, God, how would you have for me to fast? Um, I would encourage you to fast some type of food. Uh, If you end up doing a complete fast, please consult physicians. Uh, But but whether it's a Daniel fast, we'll talk more about that. We have information on the site about that. Or you fast and be certain times of the day. Uh, You may want to also include some type of media fast. You can read more of the words, spend more time with God. We're also going to have every day, I'm excited about this, We'll have team members doing 21 days of, of uh, devotionals. We'll be reading through the book of Acts, which I'm really excited about. Really the narrative of the early church. And uh, we'll have some teams sharing every day via our YouTube channel. So subscribe if you have not uh, to be a part of, uh, of that. It's going to be a great, great time. A great start to the new year. Hard to believe we're already here. Uh, but so excited for what God has in store uh, for your life personally and for our church corporately. Uh, Today, we are wrapping up our series um, uh, on our Advent series, where we've been talking about the four themes of Advent. And before I do, I also want to make note of, uh, being that it's Sunday, December 26th, uh, we are coming close to the year end, and um, just so you know, I know a few weeks ago we took up our legacy offering as a church. If you have not participated, that offering is still open and available. That offering will go towards accelerating the mission, a uh, vision that God has for us as a church, help us to reach more people with the good news of Jesus, develop and disciple all generations, and make a greater difference in the Washington, D.C. area and beyond. And uh, I want to invite you to consider Catalyst Church in your year end giving uh, because here's what I know, your investment in the kingdom of God will impact people's eternity and leave a lasting legacy far beyond your time here on earth. Uh, you can mail in any check postmarked uh, 1231, check our mailing address on our website. Of course, you can give via our safe and secure website as well. And uh, as always, church, thank you for your faithful and consistent generosity over this year. Uh, it's enabled us to make a significant difference in the lives of people in Jesus' name. Uh, but today we're wrapping up our fourth installment. If you've missed any of the installments, go on our website, check out the YouTube channel uh, or our podcast. Uh, we were hitting the four themes of Advent over this season. Uh, we've talked the first week was on peace, the second week on hope, then we hit on the topic of joy, and then today it's love. We're talking about the power of love. And before we dive in, Uh, Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father, we thank you for this moment and opportunity we have to open up your word. Uh, God, we posture our hearts and our minds to receive from you. We love you. We honor you. Lord, it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Our foundational passage out of this uh, series, Isaiah 9, 6, says this, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, for the government will be in his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Now, this topic of love, and while it's relevant for us, is because, you know, um, the whole idea of Christmas, uh, that God sent his son Jesus to the earth uh, and born uh, from a virgin, he he sent Jesus to the earth, fully God, fully man, to one day give his life for you and me in the greatest act of love the world would ever know. 
Uh, and that's really a, what this season is uh, about, is the love of God. And we're going to talk about today to understand the love of God, get a grasp on the love of God in our lives so that we can really experience it for ourselves and then love others in return as Jesus invites us to. We're going to read 1 John 4 as our base uh, scripture today. Verse 7, uh, we're going to read a fair amount of scripture. It's about 15. Uh, we love the Bible here at Catalyst Church. So you can follow along uh, uh, on the screen uh, or at home with your Bible. It says this, Dear friends, John writes, Let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us, and also we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we, if we know that we live in him, and he in us, he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testify the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them, and they live in God. And so we know and rely on the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us, that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment, and the one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God, God but yet hates his brother and sister is a liar. Whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love a God whom they have not seen. He has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. You're, you're, you're welcome. Your Bible reading is done for the day. Uh, John actually writes First and Second John to give context. He wrote these letters uh, really to combat heresy in the church. And he takes chapter 4 really to speak on this topic of love. There was some misunderstanding, some false teaching about love. Number one, to have an understanding and grasp of the love of God. Number two, to now how do we extend that love to others? And there's some practical applications, in fact, three points that I want to draw out uh, that we can apply to our own life on this topic of love. Here's the first one. Write this down if you're taking notes. And if you're not taking notes, write this down. Is experience God's love. He says this, that the God is love. The very essence and nature of who God is, is he is love. That we would not be able to know love, nor understand love, nor comprehend love if it were not for God. And you were made, and I was made in the image of God. Therefore, we were created in the image of a God who is love, the God who signified through his son Jesus dying on a cross, agape, sacrifice, love, that we would not know, we would not be able to love others if it was not for God. And this word love is the word agape, which is not the feeling of love. Come on, not the love they try to market to us in a romantic comedy, but a love that is action-oriented, a love that is not based upon feeling. It's a love that's a choice, and it's a love that is sacrificial. Also, mind you, God's love for you has nothing to do with you, meaning this, there is nothing that you can do to fall uh, to lose God's love for you. But let me get back to this idea that we were made in the image of God, and God is love and gives us the uh, capacity to love. You know, recently my daughter Hannah came home from school, and uh, she was telling me they were having a conversation with her classmates about their favorite sports teams. And Hannah said, Dad, I told them, my favorite teams are the Baltimore Ravens and the Washington Nationals. Now, mind you, my year daughter is brilliant and amazing. However, she has never watched the Baltimore Ravens or Washington Nationals game in its entirety. The only reason my daughter knows the Baltimore Ravens, the greatest team, and the Washington Nationals, uh, we're coming back next year, uh, is because those are my favorite teams. And I've told her about them. Uh, in fact, she was young. It was cute. She was younger. Um, I taught her how to make a Ravens call. And uh, I have video of her as a young girl. It's really adorable. Uh, but you got to train up the child in the way they should go uh, so they don't become Steelers fans. You know what I'm saying? So uh, get back to it. Become spiritual again. 
But she would not be able, she would not know of those teams if it was not for her father. And John's saying we would not know love, comprehend love, have the capacity to love if it was not for God. I love what Paul said in Romans 8, speaking about the the love of God. He says this, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Uh, Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or the sword? For I'm convinced neither death nor life, angels nor demons, present nor future, nor powers, their height, depth, or anything in all creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I love this. Paul reminds the The church at Rome, there's nothing that you can do that can separate you from God's love. There's nothing you can do to change the way God loves you. And that's good news. You know, Paul said in Romans 5, 8, that when we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And when you were at his worst, God gave you his best. That's how much God loves you. And that's good news. Because if we're not careful, we can, we can unintentionally fall into a sense of religion thinking that somehow my standing with God or God's love for me is somehow contingent upon what I do for him. I, I even see it, uh, even recently my kids, I noticed when they do something that is contrary to my instructions, uh, they disobey their dad's instructions. When I correct them or I come to them, sometimes they'll even say this like, oh, you don't love me. And then I'll often quickly correct them and say, no, your dad loves you. Nothing can change your father's love for you. There's nothing you could ever do. I'm just merely bringing to your attention that you didn't do what I asked you to do. And sometimes, I know back when I first came to Christ, and I've talked to other Christians who had this thought, that sometimes I used to think when I would sin, when I would not obey the word of God, and I would not do what I knew God wanted me to do, that I would somehow think that I've fallen out of love with God, that somehow God was punishing me, that somehow God was upset with me, that he was mad at me, that somehow he loved me less because of what I did. And I want you right now to hear this, please, clearly. This is a true, powerful, important theological truth. There is nothing you can do to cause God to not love you. Because in you and your worst state, God loved you. When you thought to yourself, I deserve to be loved by no one, God still loved you. It wasn't a feeling-based decision by God. It was a decision he made because it's who he is. I love what C.S. Lewis says. Though our feelings come and go, God's love for us does not. Listen, for some of you, you need to rest with that truth this Christmas. Maybe 2021 has been a difficult year. You need to end the year resting in the promise that God loves you. Let me get practical because the point experience God's love. John 15, Jesus said this, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you'll remain in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this so my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. So he says this moment that to remain in my love. And then he says, if you keep my commands, you'll remain in my love. Now, now you can read that and think to yourself, are you saying if I obey, you'll love me? That's not what he's saying. Here's what, here's what that scripture's saying. If we remain in the word of God, if we remain obedient to the word of God, the instructions of God, we remain aware of the love of God. If you are feeling somehow that God loves you less, if you're questioning his forgiveness of a past sin, if you're questioning his grace and his mercy, my question for you is, how has your time been in his word? Because when you read the word of God, and maybe you're newer to the Bible, you're newer to faith, I would encourage you, read through the gospels three times before you read anything else. And then read the New Testament three times before you ever enter the Old Testament because get an understanding of the gospel and the love of God and the nature of God and the life of Christ so that you can fully comprehend the love that he has for you. That's what Christ is saying. Remain in my love. Live according to my commands. Live according to my ways. And you can remain aware of the love that God has for you. Can I give you a challenge? Can I give you a resolution, a goal for 2022? You can write this down. It's to read more of the Word of God. Maybe for some of you, you haven't picked up a Bible in months years. Maybe you just start with, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the Bible at least once a week. For some of you, you read it here and there. I mean, here, here's, I think, the ultimate idea is read the Bible every single day. I'm telling you. 
It'll begin to change your understanding and awareness of how much God loves you. Paul writes in Ephesians 3.17 to the church at Ephesus, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have the power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, long, high, deep the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the measure of all the fullness of God. It's interesting that that, that Paul writes this, being rooted and established of love, and he says, together with all the Lord's people. And here's what Paul is speaking to, that we cannot fully grasp the extent of the love of God outside of community with the people of God. Can I tell you, that's why church is so important. Listen, church is not just a service to attend and and, uh, experience to, to take in, or a message to receive. It's a family you belong to. Listen, I'm grateful for online church. I'm grateful for Sundays like today. We can give our dream team a moment to to breathe and rest. But can I tell you, online church and in-person church are completely different experiences. See, when you're online, you're consuming a service. When you come and you are gathered together with believers, you are part of a community. The family of God, the Bible says. See, church isn't a service to consume or experience. It's a family you're a part of. Can I tell you, here's what Paul's saying. You will not fully comprehend how much loves you until you experience the love of God in community. It's when you have somebody pray with you, when you have someone to support you, when you have someone to come around you. That's why I encourage you, do not attend a church. Plant yourself in a church. Embed yourself in the life of church. Get involved in community groups when they launch in February. Come to Next Steps next Sunday. Get involved in a serving team. Embed yourself in the life of the community. Allow yourself, the Bible says, carry each other's burdens. Allow people to carry your burdens and allow yourself to carry other people's burdens. Listen, there are some of you, this is not all of you, some of you need to hear this. You need to allow other people to love you. I was talking to somebody recently, and they were saying, they use this phrase, which I've heard it a number of times, and I myself have been there. And they said, they said I, have a, I have a hard time allowing people to help me. Can I tell you, if that's you, you need to allow people to help you and to serve you, to carry your burden in 2022. Because you need to receive the tangible love of God through the life of somebody else. And you then in turn to do that for other people. It's not a one-way street. Don't just receive, 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 but then give, which brings us to our point number two. So we experience God's love. And secondly, is we extend God's love to others. Hello, Paul. Hello, John says this. How can you say you love a God that's not seen, but you can't love your brother and sister that you do see? John kind of calls it out. Again, it's a, it was a heretical teaching and understanding in the church that somehow I can love God but not love people. And John says, no, don't get it twisted. If you say you love God, you, you, you must love people. I was reminded back when I was in a, a young child and I go to vacation Bible school. I went to vacation Bible school as a kid. And uh, my mom would always give me money for the offering. Now, Young Jeremy would receive that money. And I think to myself, I know mom gave this to me for the offering, but young Jeremy needs some money too. Come on, somebody. So I was like, maybe how mom ain't gonna know when I'll put it in the offering if I hold on to this just for a little something for myself. Maybe it's an offering to me. <laughs> but I knew. <laughs> Maybe it was the Holy Spirit convicting my heart. I knew, now I'm supposed to give this in the offering. In other words, my mom gave me that money to give to somebody else. Can I tell you, God loves you, period, but he also desires for you to love people, that you would extend that love to others, not just keep it for yourself, but that, but that you would love people. Others. That's what John's saying. Is don't, don't just merely say you love God without loving people. In Luke 10, 26 is the words of Jesus. He's <clears throat> talking to a, a young lawyer. He asked Jesus about what's the greatest commandment, what's written in the law, how do you read it? He says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, do this and you will live. 
So this, this man recalls the great commandments. Now, Jesus takes over 600 Old Testament commandments and breaks them down into two. These two commandments actually also are in the Old Testament. So Jesus breaks them down over 602. I love God because he simplifies things. And I love the very essence and nature of the two commandments, the great commandments that Jesus gives us. The very essence and nature is love. Love God, and we love him by knowing his word, obeying his word, and love people. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, then if you know the story, you know, he, he then goes and, and he asks him, well, who's my neighbor? <laughs> Who am I supposed to love? Now, let me just say this too, that when we, when we experience the love of God, the natural overflow of that should be our love for others. You know, I was reminded back when the, uh, the Washington Nationals won the World Series a few years ago. And there was this excitement and joy in the city. Like so much so, when I would go out in public, wear my Nationals hat, like some random person would just yell, go Nats. Like you're high-fiving guys and, and people at the, at the gas station. You don't even know who they are, but you're hugging each other, right? Like it just brought the city together. Like the D.C. area was just excited. There was an, the, over, the, the excitement of the Nationals overflowed throughout the city. In the same way, in the life of a follower of Jesus, the love of Christ should overflow in our life onto the people around us, starting with our own home, our family, our neighbors, our coworkers, our church, our community should feel the love of God. But then the person asks, who's my neighbor? And Jesus gives this parable. Many of you know there's a parable of the Good Samaritan to give an example of what love looks like. And here's what he says. Uh, Jesus says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. But as a, <clears throat> verse 33, uh, just to give context, I skipped over a few verses where they have the, 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 the priest and the Levite walk by the man. So the man is here uh, lying in pain on the ground. They walk by, but here comes a Samaritan. He came to the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his donkey, brought him to an inn, took care of him. He took out two denarii, gave him to the innkeeper, said, look after him. When I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense he may have. You know, if he ordered pay-per-view, fight, if he had, you know, room service and the like. Um, which of these three do you think the neighbor was a neighbor to the man? who fell into the hand of the robbers, the expert of the law said, the one who had mercy on him, go and do likewise, Jesus says. Uh, there's a couple qualities and characteristics of the love the Samaritan shows that I want to point out. I think it's important for us to apply to our life. Here, here's the first one. The love of the good Samaritan was unconditional. In that culture, for a Samaritan to do anything good for a Jew or a Jew to do anything good for a Samaritan was unheard of. It, it was typical in that culture that you loved with conditions. Like, like, you love certain people. But much like in our own culture, it's acceptable maybe in some places to, good, to, to, to do good and to show love. Remember, love's not a feeling. Love is an action. To do good, to show love to people who maybe they, they think like you, vote like you, come from a similar background of you. And here Jesus models something, which would have been radical in this moment, that love has no condition. Like, you... You drop all conditions. In fact, can I give you a challenge? Maybe this Christmas this holiday season this week, you're going to interact with some family members that maybe rub you the wrong way. Maybe they always bring up politics and you disagree. <laughs> or maybe you have a coworker who's getting on your nerves. Maybe there's somebody in your life who is hard to love. Can I give you a challenge right now? Intentionally love that person. I'm not saying feel love for them. Show love through service, through generosity, through kindness. That's the love of the Samaritan. That's the love that God wants for us to give. The second characteristic of his love is that his love was inconvenienced. That, that the, the Samaritan was going about his day, and he stopped and took the time, not only bandaged his wounds, but he brought him to a hotel. Like, he was interrupted. The priest and the Levite were like, I don't have time for this. The Samaritan was interrupted, was inconvenienced. Uh, you, if you've been around college, I may say this before, but the majority of the miracles that Jesus performed were interruptions. Can I tell you, perhaps we are missing the activity of God because we are so consumed with our schedule and our way of doing things, we don't allow ourselves to be interrupted or inconvenienced. Now, can I give you a challenge? <laughs> if you're like me, being inconvenienced and interrupted is not your natural inclination. 
I, I like to keep my schedule. If I have an idea, my routines, the way things are going to go, but I want to challenge you, intentionally allow yourself to be inconvenienced and interrupted. It could be as simple as letting a car merge over into your lane on 495. Come on, somebody. <laughs> letting somebody in. Letting someone cut in front of you in line. Instead of fighting for your way, man, allow people to interrupt you, to inconvenience you. Can I tell you something? You know, our Sunday services, we call worship services. You want to know why? I, I know for some of you, Sunday mornings could be inconvenient. I know it's more convenient to listen to the message while you're on the elliptical machine or you're working out or you're driving. But listen, it's called a worship service for a reason. Listen, I know it's more convenient to watch church whenever you would like to, but it's a worship service we offer unto God so we inconvenience ourselves. We get up early on Sunday morning and we come to the house of God to worship. Why? Because I'm being inconvenienced for God. Can I tell you, you want to increase love for someone, inconvenience yourself for someone. When's the last time you inconvenience yourself for God? When's the last time you inconvenienced yourself for your spouse, your kids, your coworkers, your church family? Can I tell you, I'm going to give a shout out to our setup team, to those who come early. And our production team, our setup team, our kids team, they come early, 7.30, some earlier, Sunday mornings. They inconvenience themselves. Why? Because they love God and they love you. I love our dream team. They, they display this so beautifully. We are called to have a love that inconveniences ourselves. Listen, I know it's not easy. It's not natural for me. To be honest. The Lord has been breaking me of this with three children. At home, I am frequently interrupted. My routines are frequently blown up. <laughs> but I, I still have so much to grow. I, I, and I believe perhaps you listening today, you do as well. Allow yourself to be inconvenienced. Then lastly is his love is generous. I love is generous. You know, not only did he pour the oil and wine, he gave him some of the, his own items and clothing, but he also gave two denarii, which is two days' wages, which would have been enough for two months of stay at the end. So imagine two months of stay at a local hotel. That's what he gave him to cover all expenses. They said whatever else he, he whatever pay-per-view he orders, if he loves USC fights, I'll, I'll cover it. If he, if he wants to get that room service, I'll cover the filet mignon. He had this generous spirit. And I want to challenge you. I don't know what, you know, for you, how generous you were in 2021, but I want to challenge you to set a goal in generosity. Set a goal in 2022 to give more. Give more of your time. Give more of your talent. Give more of your treasure. Listen, I know it's a big ask. But the very essence and nature of the love of God is generous. For God so loved the world that he gave, gave. Uh, how is your life of generosity? The Bible says the generous will prosper. The word prosper means to be pushed forward. To, 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 that God wants to prosper your life, to push you forward through generosity. And I would encourage you, and pray and ask God, God, how can I increase in generosity? Maybe it's increasing that percentage of what you give away uh, in your budget. Maybe for some of you, it's becoming a tither. For others of you, percentage giver. Maybe for some of you, it's saying, you know what? Man, if I have opportunities, I'm gonna, I'm gonna serve more. Whether it's with a local organization, your local church, your, your kid's school. Man, get, be a more generous person. Have a generous spirit. That's what love looks like. Jesus said this in John 13, 34. A new command I give you, love one another, as I've loved you, you must love one another. By this, everyone, he says, will know you, my disciples, if you love one another. Jesus said this right after he got done washing his disciples' feet. Come on, which he knows is an act of love. Uh, he, he served them, and he said, by this kind of love, this, this service-oriented, sacrificial, generous kind of love. He said, this will be the identifying marker of a Christian. If you want to know if you're growing spiritually, ask the people closest to you, am I growing in love? That is the marker of spiritual growth. It's not, it's not biblical knowledge. It, it, it's not church attendance. Although all, both of those, you should read the Bible and attend church. You should do those things. 
But Jesus said that those things that you put in your life, your prayer time, your worship, your body, that should increase your level of love. Are you, are you a more loving person year over year? Are you growing in love? Jesus said this is the identifying marker. As I was thinking about identifying markers, I was reminded, um, it's been years now, maybe five, six, seven years, I was invited to go hunting with some friends years ago. Now, some of you got very uncomfortable because you love animals, and I'm sorry. I love Bambi too, but Bambi does taste decently. I'm sorry. Uh, I went hunting. Now, I didn't shoot anything, so don't hold it against me. Um, In fact, I didn't see anything. But I went hunting uh, for deer, and... um, uh, Anyways, my, my, I, had, I, had, I had no gear. I'm not a hunter. I went, I went, I've been one time, and I haven't gone since. I have no gear. And they gave me an orange hat and an orange vest. And it was in this middle of nowhere um, that where I was on this property. And, and they said, make sure you wear this orange hat and orange vest. He said, that way people know you're the hunter, not the hunted. So thank you. That's helpful. And sure enough, I'm grateful because I was at a spot I went to go walk out. We all left and went to our various locations. And I got, re- I, I kind of settled in one spot. And all of a sudden, I heard this guy calling out to me. He was already there. Thank God I had my orange hat on. He could see me. Like, and when you're hunting in the woods, that's your, that's your marker that you are the hunter, not the hunted, that you're wearing, you're wearing orange. So I had to find a new spot. And again, in the same way that stands you out in the midst of, of woods where you're hunting, in the same way, Jesus says, my follower, you should stand out in your workplace by how well you agape, serve, or generous. Would people know at your workplace that you are a Christian by how well you love, how generous you are? Would people in your neighborhood know you follow Jesus by how generous and service-oriented you are? Would people be able to tell by the way that you love your family? The way, would your fellow church members know by the way you serve people at church that you are a follower of Jesus? That's what he said is our identifier. I love what David Wilkerson said, a pastor, author. Love is not something you feel, only something you feel. It's something you do. Love has an action to it. Extend God's love to others. And here's a final point. <laughs> This is more of a statement, but I have some application for it. Is that enemy love is the most powerful love. See, he says this, John. He, he says, whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love the brother and sister whom they cannot see, who have seen, cannot love God whom they have not seen. He, he deals with the idea of hating other people. Having enemies. Jesus said this in Luke 6, 27. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. (laughs) He says, do good to those. You know, I think one of the hardest things to do to someone whom you don't like, let me take it a step further, to someone who's hurt you or wronged you, is to do good to them. Do you know what I found personally? When someone has offended me or someone has hurt me, that when you do acts of kindness, it can quell the anger in your heart. I, I've learned that the hard way. I'm not saying I'm an expert at it. It still is a discipline for me if there's somebody who somehow has hurt me or offended me to do good to them. Whew, it's hard. He says, pray for those who persecute you. Bless those who curse you. Can I give you a role of just a practical application? If you ever feel, if the thought of somebody causes a curse word to come to your lips, come on, it's okay to be honest. Instead of letting that out, bless them. Bless them. Bless them. Pray for them. Bless their relationships. Bless their finances. Bless their health. Bless the work of their hands. Bless the call of God in their life. And what's intriguing Jesus, to give context, he gave this message to disciples, Hebrew young men, and more than likely would have been in the presence of Roman guards. Now, why is it important? Is that Roman guards were oppressing Hebrew Christians. 
They were oppressing the Jews as well. So Jesus would have said in in earshot of the Roman guard, in the presence of young Hebrew men, love your enemies, i.e. the Roman guard who oppresses you, who beats you, who mistreats you, who is the author of the injustice against you. Love them. That would have been mind-blowing. Mind-blowing. Because in that culture, it was an eye for an eye. You wrong me, I wrong you. Much as it's acceptable in our culture today. It's acceptable to, to wrong someone who's wronged you, retaliate against someone who's retaliated against you. And Jesus says, do good to them. Pray for, pray for them. You know what I found personally? When you pray for someone who's hurt you, it may not always change the situation. It may not even change that person. But it always changes my heart. It will always change your heart. You know, just even this week in preparing for this message, God brought some people to my mind that had hurt me in the past. And, and it was a discipline. I didn't feel like praying for them. I'm going to be honest. Like, it, it, sometimes it's a discipline to push through. But I'm telling you, it was good for my heart. I'm telling you, it's good for your heart. Pray for them. Bless them. To do good for them. The Bible says in Romans 12, Paul says to the church at Rome who was being persecuted, is to leave room for the vengeance of God. To let them be, let God take care of it. Give, give it to him. You know, Jesus goes on to say this in verse 29. <coughs> if someone slaps you on the cheek, turn the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt. Give to everyone who asks of you. If anyone takes what belongs to you, don't demand it back. Do to others what you have have them do to you, but love your enemies, do good to them, lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be the children of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Your reward will be great in heaven. You may not get the reward you want here on earth, that when you do good to them and you pray for them and you bless them, you may not get them coming to you humbly, repenting for the wrong they've done. But you will have a great reward in heaven. Can I give a, a 2021, 22 application for this as well? We have a culture right now where if someone does something wrong to them, we, we almost deem it as unforgivable. I don't like to use cliche terms, but cancel them. We'll say what you've done is unforgivable. It's too hard. And listen, I'm not saying that people should not be responsible for the consequences of their actions because they should. However, our God, Jesus Christ, thank God he never canceled any of us. Thank God he never deemed anything that we've done is unforgivable. And we are called to extend that forgiveness to others. And can I tell you, you can stand as a follower of Jesus in 2022. Be someone who's quick to forgive. Paul said this in Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Paul says, hey, don't, don't forget what you've been forgiven of. Do, do you want to grow in your forgiveness of others? Remember what God's forgiven you of. Recall all of the sin in your heart that you've done. Thank God for what he's forgiven you of so you can forgive others. You know, he says that word compassionate to one another. That means to be sympathetic. You know, I know this is cliche, but there's truth to it. You probably heard it before, but hurt people hurt people. Oftentimes, when we have unresolved hurt and bitterness and offense in our heart, sometimes the overflow of that, even unintentionally, we hurt other people because we respond out of the offense in our heart. There may be something our father did years ago, something a former boss did, an ex-spouse did. And if we don't allow God to heal that offense, we don't forgive that person, we'll end up taking the hurt, and it spills out onto other people, usually those closest to us. And when you begin to have that lens that perhaps the person who's hurt you was hurt themselves, it doesn't mean they'll hurt less, but you go in sympathy. And I found when you go in sympathy for someone, it's easier to forgive someone. Forgiveness simply means you release taking revenge. You release expecting them to do something for you because of the wrong they've done to you. And maybe for some of you, before 2021 closes, you need to forgive some people. Maybe who've hurt you this year, 
Maybe they hurt you in 2016. Maybe they even hurt you back in 1998. I don't know. But before the year closes, you need to take some time and pray. Here's what I found. Forgiveness is often a process more than it is a moment. Because sometimes after you forgive someone, you might feel like, have I ever truly forgiven them? But maybe the thought of them or something they've done before, it almost like reoffends you. And you need to kind of work out the forgiveness where you can fully release them so you can do good to them, pray for them, bless them. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who knows something about forgiveness, knows something about loving your enemies, says agape is disinterested love. It does not begin but it became discriminating between the worthy and unworthy people or any qualities people possess. It begins by loving others for their sake. Therefore, agape love makes no distinction between friend or enemy. It's directed from both. We're not called to love some people, church. We are called to love all people. Here's my challenge for you this week. Maybe for some of you, you need to spend some time in just receiving the love of God. Maybe spend some time pouring over the gospels over the next several days and allow the love of God to just be, become more aware of it. Maybe for 2022, you need to get more embedded in the life of your church and, and get around other people so you can, you can feel the love of God through other people. Others of you, you need to grow in extending God's love to others by becoming more inconvenienced. Make it a discipline. I'm going to be inconvenienced every day. Some way, I'll inconvenience myself for others. Maybe it's learning to say, I'm going to love without conditions. I'm not going to only love certain people. I'm going to love all people regardless of their beliefs, of their backgrounds, law people. Maybe it's growing in your generosity. The very essence of nature of agape, love, is to give. Generous to all areas of your life. And lastly, maybe for some of you, it's loving your enemies. It's praying for those who've hurt you, blessing them, forgiving them. And I believe this, as we begin to grow in love, we experience the power of love in our life. Let me pray for you. I want to pray with two groups of people. You can bow your heads right where we are at home. And if you're here and you would just simply say, Jeremy, I want to grow in God's love in my own life, become more aware of his love, become more a loving person, I'm going to pray with you. Just right where you are. Just receive this, this prayer. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, those who want to grow in love, we would grow in a greater awareness of your love for us. God, we would then extend that to other people. God, that we will be identified by how well we love, how quickly we forgive, how generous we are, how willing to be inconvenienced, how we love without conditions. We would stand out by that, Lord. Empower us by your spirit to do so in Jesus' name. I want to pray one more group. If you're here watching and you feel far from God, maybe you've never come into a relationship with Jesus and experienced the true love of God, or maybe you, you once did, but you, you've, you've grown distant from God. You need to come back into a relationship with him. That's who I want to pray with you as well, right where you are. Just pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for going to the cross and giving your life for me. I repent of my sin. I turn towards you. I said you lead me and you guide me. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, Catholic family, show some love to those who made that decision right now. Hey, if you did, there's an online connection card right there. You can fill that out. Let us know. We'd love to follow up with you, give you some next steps, help you grow in that relationship with Christ. And uh, we're so excited for you. But hey, church, we're going to transition, maintain an attitude of worship in the time of bringing of our tithes and the giving of our offering. And I want to thank you for your faithful and consistent generosity, church. You'll see below ways you can give, our text to give, also our uh, our website, yourcatalystchurch.com, is a safe and secure way for you to give. And I want to encourage you, uh, as we're, you know, five days away uh, from celebrating the new year, uh, to consider Catalyst Church in your year-end giving. Again, I truly believe your investment in the kingdom of God, it will make a difference in people's eternal life. And it will leave a lasting legacy far beyond your time here on earth. Of course, our legacy fund still remains open. If you like to give towards our legacy a fund above and beyond the tithe. And uh, I would encourage you lastly with this. For some of you, you need to make that, make that goal of how to grow in your generosity for 2022. Here's what I know. If you do so, you'll be glad you did. You'll be better because of it as we move into this new year. Let's pray with the offering. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to give to you.
and to the work that you're doing through this church. I bless those who are giving the gifts and the lives that will be impacted through it in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Well, hey, if you are, again, new, joining us here online, we're so glad you joined us. Uh, fill out that online connection card. would love to connect with you. And uh, if you live in the Washington, D.C. area, I'd love to invite you to come next Sunday in person. I'm so excited to be back in person. I already miss you. Uh, we're going to be back in person, uh, 930, 1115 at the Bethesda Hotel, 8120 Wisconsin Avenue, Bethesda, Maryland. Can't wait to see you to celebrate the new year. Uh, listen, start the year right by being in church. I, I do believe uh, the first things we do are important. Um, I, I think it's important the way we posture our hearts. And uh, we'll talk more about that next Sunday. Um, but I, I believe one, one important first step is, is by starting the new year in church as we kick off a brand new series, Play the Long Game. It's going to be a great, great time preparing for 21 days of prayer and fasting. And if you haven't come to the next steps, come next Sunday, uh, the next steps. Uh, take that step to get planted and embedded in the life of a local church. Again, I believe this church, if you do so, you will be better because of it, and you will be glad you do if you do so. Well, thank you so much for joining in today. We're so grateful you took time out of your day uh, to worship with us, and I uh, cannot wait to see you next Sunday, uh, both in person and for those out of the area online. Before you go, receive this blessing before you turn off. Uh, I pray the Lord to bless you and keep you. He make his face to shine upon you, be so gracious to you. He'll give you great peace in every relationship. And may this week he help you experience more of his love. And may his spirit empower you to love others in a greater way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I love you so much, Catalyst Church. I cannot wait to see you next Sunday as we kick off 2022 strong in Jesus' name.